So thanks for both of you for joining us on Late Light. Not at all. No. It's been really... Oh, yeah. you're going to go as well? Sorry, I thought that was quite the end. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry. No, 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 you've got to do another minute. That was a good side. Okay, yeah, like yeah, sorry. We'll um, keep that for the end, though. Okay. We we'll keep that for the beginning. You can edit. Right? Cut yeah. it off. And then yeah. We can. Yeah. We can yeah. edit. We can edit. But we've got a very important question to ask you before we begin, and that is, are you heretics? Well, we have begun. Are you heretics? Heretics? Mm. Well, like for, with fleas? Well... I, I could put it another way. Yeah. Apostates, no, iconoclasts. I'm so sorry. Ooh, schismatics. Iconoclasts. That's very good. Non-believers. We destroy icons. That's what we do. Have you ever committed a heresy against the Holy Mother willingly, Church? Willingly, yes, every day. Yes, yes. Because yes, yes. I believe in the separation of church and planet. Yeah. Anyway, you've admitted it all, right? Admitted all what? Well, the heresy. Yes. Because I was looking for proof that nobody... Expects the Spanish I know which Inquisition. Way going. Ah. <laughs> I was just feeling ashamed for you. I know. Well, the, the terrible thing is that my my main weapon lines. was surprise. Yeah. And you subverted it immediately. Yeah. Oh, very good. Subversion is what we do. Yes, okay, well, that, I mean, heresy is what we do. Because yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I, for example, have had a lot of fun the last two weeks with political correctness. You see, now my views are heretical to people who believe in, in political correctness, right? Well, yes, sir. And I'm, I'm also very odd because I think there's more than just a, a, a materialist planet, a materialist yes. reductionist planet, which is, I think, what he and his friend Brian Cox believe. Yeah, right? we just believe in a huge universe of billions of miles and they, you know... One, yeah. that, one that's completely pointless. Well, I would I don't know. There no? might well be point because there were these animals like us existing and thinking and giving interviews on Australian television. <laughs> that's not normal. <laughs> it's in the middle of this huge explosion. It's no, awful. it was inevitable. Eric, I'm gonna, are you Darwin actually saying that you. there is a meaning to life? I, I, that's the first time I've heard you admit it. I didn't say there was a meaning. I said it's quite an interesting question to look at how humanity can arise and consider itself inside this enormous explosion. That's quite weird. And the, the, the God answers are completely pathetic and useless and get you nowhere because who made God? But the idea that we evolved and with these thoughts is actually very fascinating to me. Do you, do you buy into this thing about um, uh, political correctness that John is talking about? And, and I, what I'm wondering is, could you do what you used to do now um, well, I mean, with the kind of social not. media environment that we have? I don't have. think we could. I don't think you'd ever get an executive to okay it now, but I don't think the audiences would like it. We did it though too, you know, we, I think we cut, I cut one joke for political correctness. What was it? And I thought, cut, because um, we had a silly, we had silly Olympics, and there's one joke where it's 100 yards for the deaf, and the guy comes out with a gun and he goes, bang, and they stay there. A funny joke in its time, but then I thought, actually that is laughing at an infirmity. Mm. So it's not kind of fair, it's not a joke that deaf people can enjoy. Well, I enjoyed it, and I'm deaf. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking wrote it. <laughs> so oh, I, 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 think there are, I think there are moments. All, all human is oh, sorry. All humour is critical. You know, you may make stupid jokes. Why well, you? You know, I mean, stupidity is an infirmity, isn't it? John, what would you steer away from now, though? I mean, if you if you do agree um, that political correctness has changed the landscape, would you steer away from anything? Well, I would have to consider each case. I mean, there's certain things. I don't want to hurt people. But at the same time, it's a bit, the political career is a bit like a granny. Uh, they made an art arriving at a party when everyone's having a good time. And she comes in, they all start sort of buttoning up and becoming self-conscious and behaving properly. And then when she leaves, you can have fun again. Well, a lot of humor is about just enjoying life and spontaneity. And because you make a joke to put somebody down, we're always teasing each other. It's with affection. It's nasty teasing that we want. Not, not, not all teasing. Nasty teasing you cut out. And there's certain racial jokes I certainly wouldn't tell yeah. because they're just mean and actually not funny. Mm. Right. You, tell us um, about the kind of humour that we're going to see uh, with your show in Australia because um, you've, you've made the point it's not a Python show. Uh, but on the other hand, you have said, Eric, people don't want new material. But we give them that anyway. I mean, it's, it's more like it starts off with like a conversation about 53 years we've been known each other. And then it goes into it changes nightly. And then we do some bits of, of material which they don't know. Mm. And it's nice to give a sketch that they haven't heard. Uh, I like that. And it's more fun for us, too. They were written at the same time as Python, 
for a show that he and I used to do together with Marty Feldman called The 1948 Show, but nobody knows this material. And any of it could have gone into Python. But we don't want to go and do the old Python stuff anymore because we just did that definitively at the O2. And it was, as Eric said, it was a sweet goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. a very ten, good ten, way to do it. That's it. Ten sold out shows. Um, were you surprised um, to, that this happened? I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't have been particularly surprised if I were you. I mean, uh, it seemed to me that you guys the were the, out. the Rolling Stones of comedy. So why not? Well, I, I, the Rolling Stones never stopped being on the road, though. They're always selling tickets. But we didn't. We, we hadn't been to uh, perform together since the Hollywood Bowl in 1980. So it was a very long time between shows. And we said, we'll do it again, you know, after that length of time, won't we? Yeah, yeah, we'll but get, we yeah. didn't know. We really didn't know. And people were saying, well, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be a terrible flop? And we didn't know. But then we read the material through. And we all started to roar with laughter at this material. You remember that read through? Yeah, absolutely. And we, were, we thought, well, if we think it's this funny, maybe they will. But when we sold the first show, 16,000 tickets in 44 seconds, we were astounded. And yeah. suddenly there were film crews from all over the world. We didn't expect that. It was a complete surprise. And I think it's partly because the British press are always so negative. They were always trying to cut you down to side. They were running articles like, is Monty Python funny? Well, the answer is, it's funny for some people and not for others. Well, it, it does raise a question, though. Uh, Mick Jagger, I mean, he was a kind of self-parody in a way, but Mick Jagger said it's a bunch of wrinkly old men trying yeah. to relive their youth and make a lot of money. Yeah, but he was being very funny. Yes, oh, that's what I, I, I mean, that, that, I it was very sweet. And he said, would you do it? I said, yeah, you absolutely did do it. that. Absolutely and it's really funny. So did you make a lot of money? We made enough money. We spent too much, really, because there was a possibility it might have gone on the road. So all that set was built just for those ten shows. And so that cost a bit. And we had a lot of boys and girls singing and dancing and orchestras. But we made enough to pay off our lawyers, which was great. Yeah. Well, we were waiting for you to come on the road with that show to Australia. We've, we've got the two of you, which is a wonderful Unfortunately, bonus. Michael Palin Michael just came Palin. on his own Palin immediately yeah, to Palin. sell his own book about his own life. <laughs> He's so nice. He just talks about himself every bloody <laughs> day. He writes his own bloody Michael's diary. You know. What does he find interesting? <laughs> There's have 32 volumes. Have you read? Not staying Sorry, awake. Is it true? Right? So, so Palin actually stopped this from happening, did he? Just through yeah, sheer self just didn't want to yeah. do it. I didn't realise We that. couldn't figure yeah. out why, but we always had a rule that if the Pisons don't want to, the Pison yeah. doesn't want to do it. You can't force him. But we didn't know why he didn't want to do it. No, right. it was very funny when he pointed out he'd gone straight off to Australia. Yeah, he went straight to Australia and did his own tour, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why you don't want to be on the road. No, but he actually, to be fair, it, it is that. Yeah, everybody has their own free choice to yeah. do what they want. And there's no reason why they should do something out of pressure. And halfway through the shows, he turned to me. We were dressed as camp judges about to go on, you know, wearing terrible glitter and underwear. And he said, I think, I think I've had enough of this. And I said, yeah, I think I've had enough of this too. This is, <laughs> we've done it. This is, this is enough. And I think that's right, because otherwise you're just becoming parodies of yourself, yeah. repeating things, even though there's an audience... But now the you're thing in Cleveland. Is we were having a good time. It wasn't so much with being a performer, but we were just enjoying the process and laughing and teasing yeah, each other. Yeah, but had you done America, now it's Cleveland, and tomorrow it's Minneapolis. You know, it, you become the Eagles. You can, know. I, can I just make the point, though? You two did go on the road um, before you came here. You've been to Florida. Um, now, I, right, is but that's, John called me up and he said, would you like to come on tour with, you know, to Florida? And I said, sure, I haven't done that. And this is not... Like O2, it could, nothing could be more different. I know I realise that, but uh, I guess the point I'm making here is Florida is the retirement capital yeah. of, of the United States, right. and I'm wondering well, we whether did explain that. Did you did you take the view that your audience are getting on? Um, we tried to find people who were older than we were. <laughs> but the truth <laughs> is, I, I thought I'd like to do a tour, and I said to Al, well, "What do you what, what do you think?" He said, "Well, it'd be fun." So I thought, "Well, where can we go where it's warm?" And we don't have to fly all the time. And the great thing about Florida is you, you, each city is about two hours' drive from everyone else. We never flew on the whole tour. Here, I'm afraid that's the one thing we're rather dreading. You know, all this stuff, Canberra to Perth and then back to Sydney. I mean, but it's a lot well, of I guess the, the, where I, what I'm getting at, I suppose, is, is has the Python humour translated to a younger generation through YouTube and so on. When you looked out into those audiences, did you see a mixture? Or there's was three it... generations. Yeah. There's oldies, and then there's children of 40s, and there's their children's children, and their children's 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 children. 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 Yes. 
So, the, yes, the, the, it appeals. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. You see nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds, and they like it. They, they particularly like Holy Grail nine-year-olds because it's adults behaving as children. Yes, that's Pretending right. to ride horses. So they love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to tell you that um, when the messages were floating around uh, the late line office, um, about the fact that we're going to do these interviews and a few jokes uh, cropped up and some of our younger colleagues didn't seem to get them. Yeah, and immediately right. I shot off an email to them that said, that's the sort of blinking Philistine pig ignorance I've come to expect from you, <laughs> non-creative <laughs> garbage. I said, all your Lutham, spotty behinds, etc. That's very et cetera. good. And um, I, I came so close to a workplace um, nuisance suit uh, that I was wondering, John, if it came to that, would you come to my defence? Oh, of course I would, because yeah. what we discover is the young people like it, but for in any England, for some reason, the BBC, which has the sole terrestrial rights for Monty Python, mm -hmm. hasn't put us on for 15 years. And, and the result of that is that a lot of young people don't know about it. And that's a fact of when it was last seen. So in, Amer in America, it's always on there. I was looking at it on YouTube, and they, you know, uh, but it was always on PBS in America, which is fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's very cheap and they play it all the time, so everybody could find it. Yeah. And you, you were both in the, I, I guess I'm going to take us to the surreal quality of the comedy um, and the, the way that it became the sort of cutting edge of comedy um, when Python first came out. And that particular skit uh, from which those lines came, the uh, revolving knives architect. Um, architect. You, you were both in that. Who, who wrote it? Who, who writes this? Chapman and I wrote it, yeah. 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 Yes, we love it. It's cruelty and unnecessary violence, it's <laughs> there. <laughs> and anything that's in all. It's witty, uh, full of life, full of yeah. shag, nasty comedy, it's me. Fuck <laughs> 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 It was a pretty wild idea. I mean, designing oh, a building yeah. <laughs> where the people go through the front door on, on, a, on a sort of moving it's walk, very, walkway it's through it's revolving very, knives. It's like, it's, it's just me. Did you just say revolving knives? <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> and that's when the first time you learn. It's a great revelation in the sketch, dramatically. The, the guy only has, yeah. has ever designed abattoirs. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, I see. When we started to write, we just st started to make each other laugh. Yeah. And we never thought about what's the target audience. There was yeah. none of that stuff. We didn't even know what the viewing figure was. Can you believe that? No. But there was a thing called AI, which is the Audience Appreciation Index. Appreciation Index, that's right. And, and we always scored highly on that, which meant that the people who'd seen the show really liked it. But we never bothered about audiences, and it was all to do with making each other laugh. Was it brave of the BBC? Was there some smart executive that thought, actually, yeah, yes. was let's brave. give these one, guys their no. head? Would they ever do yeah, that these days? It was days? one executive. No, they wouldn't do it, no. They've killed comedy. The BBC has completely screwed up comedy because it's become a bureaucracy. Right. And they think like bureaucrats, and bureaucrats shouldn't be in charge of comedy. You know? it's just what do you think, Eric? And I, think it's the, I think it's right. I think it's the same. Executives do not, on the whole, do well with comedy. They can't understand it. They can't <laughs> read it. They can't spot it coming. And but they think they can, <laughs> because they spend their whole time talking to other executives about what's working. But they have, you know, it's like a Martian trying to understand sex. You know what I mean? They cannot understand it from the inside. So why was it different back then? Um, why were they more daring? They just wanted to. They, they had a slot to fill. It was like ten thirty at night. Nobody was watching, and they wanted to go a little later in the evening. And they just put this on. He was a famous star at the time. He'd been in the Frost Report mm. and not the 48 show. So we were he was a right, reliable. We were all known as yeah, writers. Exactly. And but we went to see this guy who was head of large entertainment called Michael Mills. Bless him. And he said, uh, what are you going to do? We didn't know. We hadn't discussed it. Can you yeah. believe that? Yeah. Pitch meeting. And he said, go away and make 13 programs. But although that sounds so wonderful, there were, <clears throat> when the minutes of the BBC were released a few years ago, they discovered that there was a meeting of the heads of department. Mm -hmm. When we'd been going about five weeks, the heads of department, seven mm. out of nine of them, said that they didn't like the show. So there was always this sort of dead wood at the top that didn't really know what they were doing. So tell me about the teams, because it was notoriously um, competitive uh, within the Python team, according to accounts we've written. The BBC 
uh, website actually refers to the ruthlessly self-critical pythons. Were you constantly critiquing each well, other's work? self-critical about the material. It's yeah. a writer's commune, so we try to make it as funny as possible. And when we read things, people were very, very good at criticising. Say, listen, that was really funny up to about page three, and then it just stopped, so somebody else would take it and add or suggest an idea. So you've got very good editing ideas. As Eric said, important. you know, I mean, if I'd written a sketch with Python, then I had him and, and, and Jones and uh, the little bandy leg yeah. one, Palin, you know, this is, this is high-quality criticism. If they say the thing stops working at this yeah. point, then why don't you take it in that direction? And you really take that seriously. Well, that's got to be part of the secret, hasn't yeah, it? That and, was yes, it. You, you it mentioned is. Graham Chapman, of course, um, you know, yeah. passing hugely lamented, but, you know... He well, yeah, fairly lamented. Go on. At, 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 first, yes. <laughs> yeah, at first. But now when we're sharing the money, it's much better, isn't <laughs> much it? Much better. Yeah. Yeah. Much better. I hadn't really thought about it from that point of view, I must admit. Uh, but, you, but, John, you and Graham wrote together yeah. from quite early on, didn't you? As, I think as we a met in team. Cambridge in 60... What was it? About 61, 62. And then uh, he uh, left Cambridge a year before me, like I was a year before Eric. And he went off and became a doctor, and he did some cabaret while he was there, and I was still at Cambridge. And then the show that got me into show business, one of the guys dropped out, and Graham came into that. And after that, he left. When we got to America, he came back to become a doctor. And when I came back, we started writing together for the Frost Report, for David Frost, Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Corbett. And he, who well, I knew already, and Graham did. No, did Graham? Did, he didn't know you. That no, I saw him in Cambridge Circus, but that, we weren't uh, close. That's right. Well, we, we were uh, the three Cambridge people. And then uh, Mike, Michael Palin and Terry Jones, we'd sort of met passingly, but they were part of the writer's table mm. um, for Frost, which was a remarkable writer's table that because the, the script editor was Marty Feldman. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the key, isn't it? Because you yes. don't often find writers and performers wrapped up in the same parcel. I mean, you get it with Woody Allen and some of the people around his kind of uh, group that he grew up with. But So this is an unusual thing in a way. It was yeah. very unusual. Uh -huh. Tell me this. Um, where did the idea of merging silliness with big intellectual themes uh, come from? Eric, uh, did it go right back to Cambridge days? I think that, you know, comedy is often the little and the large, isn't mm, it? So, right. you know, you, if you're going to talk about Proust, then you're going to have a competition summarising it. It's <laughs> a very <laughs> funny right. idea. Yeah. I don't th and then I think we decided to... De uh, so the, uh, I think that comedy happened first and then we found the label afterwards and yeah. then, oh, it's silly. You said if it made us laugh, I mean, we, we knew a bit about Proust, not much but a bit. And we knew it was a pretty long book. <laughs> so summarising Proust, it wasn't as though we were all experts of Proust, but that was the kind of thing that made us make the others laugh. Do you see I'll, what I'll I come mean? to philosophy in a minute, because that would yeah. probably be a good way for us to, to end our uh, kind of interview. But just going back to um, this, uh, the art, what made uh, Python unique uh, among many things was the, the way that skits merged one into yeah. the other. Yeah. Now, Spike Milligan... Yes. Um, started That's doing right. that. Did a bit. They say that he started it and Python perfected it. Well, we looked at it and thought, oh shit, he's doing what we were going to do. Yeah. But luckily, Spike was always on the extreme edge. Hardly anybody watched him and he was pushing it, and he only had about six shows. And we, we still persisted in that because it was fun to have a sort of theme that things seemed to link. And then, that was, you were, the big secret was Gilliam. So his artwork links everything together. So it's like it's in a framework that seems to make it all about something, even though it's just a series of sketches. Yeah, that was quite inspired. I mean, it, that's, it, that, and no one had ever seen anything like no. that. I can remember seeing it at the time and thinking, And the oh BBC, when, when we talked about animation, the BBC said, you can't afford it. Do we do it? And, and, and Terry had to go off and sit down with the executives and convince them he could actually do it for very, very little money. What was it about um, growing up in Britain um, that inspired this kind of off-the-wall surrealism attached to comedy? I mean, uh, we think back a little uh, into the past and, you know, The Goon Show did this on radio, um, not as edgily. So I you think you have to go back earlier than that. There was something very strange that in the Victorian era... You know, we had um, nonsense poetry. Yeah, Edward, Edward Lear. Lear. Yeah, right. It's like it's not, it's not not sense. It's the opposite of sense, nonsense, and that's quite an interesting concept. And then uh, Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, so it has deep cultural roots, you're saying? Well, I think, well, for me, it was always beyond the fringe. And it, there was a, a yes. thing happened at the end of the war when suddenly everything was miserable, bleak and depressing, and this young generation came through in all fields, rock and roll, art, photography, fashion, and we just happened to be the ones in comedy. Comedy and came in a little bit later, because the big thing in the theatre was look back in anger with John Osborne. Right. Play. That was about 56. And in 62, um, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett, who's one of our great playwrights still alive, and Jonathan Miller still alive, absolutely brilliant comedians. They put a show together, and for the first time ever, they were making fun about all these things that we've been deferential about, like like the Prime Minister and, and the, the class Queen, system, the class system, uh, Church of England sermons. I mean, we never heard any of this stuff. Exactly. And it was socially necessary because everybody just come back from this war and then things were changing, were shifting, and it was good. It was good. very stuffy then, in the 50s. Yeah. It was fairly secure despite the, the, the Cold War. I don't think people were that living in a state of anxiety like they do now, but it was stuffy. Yeah, it, it seems to me that you, you were part of a, a breaking open That's of right. the culture, really interestingly. Um, All that generation. Thatcher later yeah. ends up sort of, you know, completing the process by trying to allow everybody to sort of come up through the ranks, as it were, and uh, in a way that was probably the, the bitter end of the class system, but you guys were right there. Yes, but the class system hasn't, the extraordinary right. thing, it hasn't really ended. We, we all thought it was out on its way out on the 60s, but uh, sorry, I, I kind of missed your point because I was thinking of Go on. That's okay. I, 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 I'm talking about this breaking open thing. Yeah. Um, it, it was that you were like breaking open the culture, but you weren't overtly political. Um, no, you weren't, we weren't doing politics. And but I'll tell you why, because this, this uh, Beyond the Fringe is a fantastic stage show, and it was such mm -hmm. a hit in London, but only in London. And then the BBC, only about four months later, did the first national satire show with David Frost. That was the week that was that had ever been done. Mm -hmm. And political satire was such a hot subject that they flogged it to death for four years. And when we came along, we got bored with political stuff. So we kind of went in a new direction, which was silly and naughty. And, ge and generically funny, rather than specifically funny about real people. Mm. Yeah. And that, so it still plays, is the good news. Well, it does. I mean, <laughs> and you were brilliant at taking the piss, um, if I can put it in those terms. And, uh, and Eric, I have to come to you on this one because... You don't have to, because my answers are pretty good. <laughs> I, I'm sure you'll get back in touch. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I think, I think I'm, I'm going to wear a kid because I think you actually probably wrote the Bruce skit or... Were we wrote the Bruce's sketch together. Oh, you wrote it together. together. I wrote the song, but we wrote the skit, skit together. Together? Yeah. Because at that time... I was married to Sheila. To a Sheila. You yeah. married to a Sheila. Yeah. So you had the Australian... I had a lot of Australian friends in, 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 in London. There were a lot what, of Australian what, why, friends came over. But why did you choose um, an Australian department of philosophy, you said, in the University of Wollamaloo. Why? Exactly. Why? Why did you do that? Well, it seems to be silly, doesn't it? Yeah. It seems like an unlikely uh, thing. Putting the two together. I yeah. mean, the key thing was there was somebody who <laughs> was uh, taught to, what was it, logical positivism, yeah. and he's also in charge of the sheep nip. You know? Yeah. <laughs> It's just a funny idea, you know, lots of It's just putting all things groups. together that are incongruous. That's yeah. so much... Yeah, We're talking about political correctness here, and I'm actually yeah. wondering, could you do that whole skit now? Uh, I'm thinking back to the original one and rules number one, three, yeah, five, Yeah, I think you can't do rule seven. four anymore. You can't do rule four? Yes. Yes. Because at the time, I think it was satirical. I can't but remember now, which one was rule four now. Was that... that no, Puff Gas. No, Puff Gas. That was I, rule number one. No, it wasn't number one. Oh, yes, it was. Was, was it number one? Was it, anyway, it was number but one. But I don't think that's four, funny five, anymore because it was mocking a certain kind of Australian uh, anti. Yeah. Yes. Anti a sort of Australia that doesn't exist since the game anymore. Mardi Gras, are you suggesting? Well, which I went to in about 25 years ago. Yeah. It was an extraordinary thing, yes. So, um, yeah, no, it's, that's, that, that, that horse is gone, you know. Yeah. And I, so I think that target has gone too because nobody can be that. I think you could do it in America, yeah. where, where they still are as nasty. In the South. Yeah. yeah. Now, I have to tell you, uh, do you guys know the writer Christopher Hitchens? Yes, of course. Hitchens, yeah. um, yes, who's a great course. friend of the Late Line yeah, program yeah, yeah. and personal friend. And uh, well, he came out to Australia, did a, a thing at the Sydney Opera House. We just talked. Mm. We talked together, as we're doing now. Oh. Um, and there was a huge round of applause at the end of people calling for an encore. And what did he do? 
he did the philosophers song. i've seen it i've You've seen, seen it. that clip because seen, seen I, I, I knew him a little bit i met did him a few you? times and i was absolutely flabbergasted he knew every word he sang the whole thing yeah and i thought oh gee it's that's sad. amazing John, I'm just gonna, I want to go back because the, the final series of Monty Python, you weren't there uh, for a lot of That's it and right. because you were off uh, with Connie Booth doing Faulty Towers, That's um, right. famously only 12 episodes. Um, and of course, you know, the, the world has been crying out ever since. For 12 more 12 or more. 12 less. <laughs> but, uh, the thing was, he did write. There's some wonderful material of yours in there, like the Buying an Ant sketch. Oh, yes, that's right. There's a lot of him in there. There were just, several reasons to leave, but one of the ones that people forget was that since the beginning of Python, uh, Graham Chapman became an alcoholic. And writing with a copper-bottomed alcoholic is not that much fun because Gray couldn't remember in the afternoon what we wrote in the morning. And none of the others. I didn't see Terry oh, Jones yeah. running forward and saying, well, let me write with Gray some but, of the time. But you'd also been doing the three-minute comedy sketch since, uh, you know, the yes, 48 right. show, much longer than we had. And he got bored with it. Much time, for something, time for something different. I, I felt we were repeating and ourselves. It, it was right. So there was the sense that artistically we weren't moving forward in an exciting way but the point was most of the others particularly Jones and 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 and, and um, Palin were just loving the process and that's yeah. fine but I wasn't but, but that's what was good about that is it led into the movies yes indeed well, then, um, if we kept on doing which, the TV shows which well. I might add uh, would not have happened it sounds like without George Harrison so uh, is that is that true or is he that paid apocryphal? for life of Brian yeah. life of Brian. four million yeah he, he mortgaged his home and and, and paid for it yeah. movie. It was Did extraordinary because you, you see you again, say? you remember I said, talked about executives not knowing what they're doing. When we went out with Life of Brian, which was recently voted in quite a sensible poll, best British comedy of all kind, we could not get finance either from a British studio or an American. We went around all the Hollywood yeah. studios, they all said no. So that's how much they know. You know? I think we're going to have to uh, wind this up. I don't want to wind we, it up. I don't either. No, well, I, I, let's I, just keep I, going and see right. what happens. Well, let's just keep going for a little while at least. <laughs> but there may be <laughs> there. Oh, Diana, you're such a bore. <laughs> Go people away, Diana O'Neill. I, I think, I think we can't keep news. people waiting. But I, I've got to, I, I'll quickly come to both of you to, to summarise really where you're Please. going. Because, yeah. um, John, 76 years old. And we hear that you're planning a, a Faulty Towers stage show. Yes. And the rumour is it's going to premiere in Australia. Is that correct? Absolutely right. I'm actually here because we're starting uh, this uh, tour together in about a week on the 25th in Gold Coast. And I'm also here to cast all the Basil, Manuel, uh, Polly, Sybil, all those plants from American actors because on uh, August the 20th will be the world premiere of 40 Towers on stage here in Sydney. Can an American actor play no, Manuel? No, well? Australian actors. Did I say American? You said American oh, actors. Yes. That's very confusing for them. stupid. Yeah. I'm sure Australian, Australian actors can play Manuel. No, only Australian actors. Only Australian. No American actors no at all. American I'm talking because actors' actors equity yeah. were just suddenly yeah, up in arms. Yeah. Phones were, were ringing. Yeah, the pitchforks yeah. were out. It was yeah. already happening. And uh, Eric, you're on the road with John, obviously, now, but you've written an e-novel. Um, you're doing a TV show on quantum physics uh, yes. with Brian Cox. What's, yes. what's next for you? Well, we'll get to film that, hopefully. The BBC are going to do it, and we're going to do it as a Christmas special. Like, and I'm doing it like Eric and Ernie. It's the what? universe. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie with me and Brian. You're a very silly man, aren't you? Thank you. What have you done? Uh, yes, I'm doing a child. I've been, you know, we what? spent months writing this down. I thing. know you have. The What's it about? Universe. It's about the universe. You will learn something from this. Yes, and, and there's uh, going to be songs. Songs. Songs yes, about absolutely. the universe. What are you thinking of? <laughs> We'd yeah, be very so disappointed if there were no songs in a, yeah, no, in a TV show. Songs, about, by the yeah. way, Brian Cox, I think, can carry a tune. He plays, he plays piano very nicely. Yeah. Does he? Yes, he does. He's, he was in D-Ream. What? He was in a group called D-Ream. In the nineties, really? gentlemen, yeah. uh, we could keep going further, right. obviously, and well, we'd love to, to do so that. Tell me more <laughs> about your musical. <laughs> no, I can't. I'm not going to. We're. Uh, <laughs> why isn't Faulty a musical? Why isn't Faulty a musical? What? Why don't you do Faulty as a musical? It'd be too. It'll slow it up too much. Mm. Because the <laughs> that's controversial. No, no. What I it? mean is, is it, what I mean is quite seriously that that kind of particle comedy has got to play at a frantic pace, and because if you stop fast. for songs, yeah. it wouldn't work. We're looking forward to that frantic right. pace from both of you and your songs, Eric. Um, we and thank Australian you. actors. Thank you. Yeah. With Australian actors. Yeah. Thank you very much, 
both of you. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Oh, you too. Thank you very much. I haven't enjoyed it. No? Much. No. Oh, I, I was faking it. Were you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's not very nice, really, is he? He's just all that smiling. Uh, uh, yeah, he does the smiling don't easily. Him. No, don't not for a second. Him, no. I don't trust uh, him. Well, it's the television people, aren't they? Did we get paid for this? No. No? No. Oh, it's promotion. What does it say?